So it's 5.30. Uh, we'll, we're ready to begin. Professor Amanda Randles, we extend a very warm welcome to you for the ACM India annual event. It's a pleasure to have you uh, meet us virtually and talk to all of us about your exciting work. Uh, let me give you uh, give a brief introduction about Professor Randles. Professor Amanda Randles is Alfred Winborn, Victoria Stever Mordecai, Assistant mm -hmm. Professor of three disciplines, Biomedical Sciences, Biomedical Engineering, and Computer Science. In addition, Professor Randles is a member of the Duke Cancer Institute. She works at Duke University, North Carolina. Professor Randles did her PhD from Harvard in the year 2013. Her research interests are at an exact intersection of biomedical engineering and computer science. She works on biomedical simulation and high performance computing specifically. When I was looking up at Professor Randall's work and her page, I was simply amazed to see the number of awards she's won given how young she is. Let me list a few of them for you. She's a senior member of the National Academy of Inventors, was nominated as senior member in the year 2019. I'm happy to share with you that Professor Randles is also a recipient of ACM uh, Grace Murray Hopper Award in the year 2017. And the thing that excited me the most was MIT Technology Review named Professor Randles as one of the 2017's innovators under 35 and a visionary for her work that she's going to talk to all of us about today. The work is on creation of computer code that models the entire arterial system at a subcellular level, which helps in diagnosing vascular diseases early on and in fine-grained detection of such diseases. Her latest project uh, is very much related to the current pandemic, very important for all of us. It deals with a ventilator splitter, uh, some kind of a complex 3D printing of a ventilator splitter that could be used on two patients simultaneously provided several different parameters match. And uh, they have a large collaboration with Microsoft and several other universities. And I hear that currently their project is under FDA approval. Good luck to you. It'll, it is, it'll be of tremendous service to the society if that works out, not only to your country, but across the world. Her talk today will be titled Role of Massively Parallel Computing in Personalized Blood Flow Modeling. Over to you, Professor Amanda. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to everyone today. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump jump right in and um, kind of what I'm, what I'm really passionate about is building large scale personalized blood flow simulations. So what I mean by that is you know, models that are tuned to a specific patient that allow us to understand how their blood is flowing, how that's influencing, you know, forces on the endothelium, how that's influencing your vasculature and causing uh, disease to progress on a person by person basis. We need these personalized blood flow models so we can understand the underlying mechanisms for that specific patient. And I'll, I'll touch on a few of the use cases, but it, it can help us identify, you know, how do we diagnose these diseases earlier? How do we do that from a non-invasive standpoint? How do we identify what the best treatment plan is for that patient individually? How do we help the doctors really in an intuitive way interact with this kind of data and identify, you know, what is the best treatment option? What is the best inter intervention for that patient? But at the end of the day, if we want to be able to run you know, large scale personalized blood flow simulations, it's also a huge computational challenge. And there are just, it touches on so many different topics and so many, um, so many different areas on the computer science field that we need people from all of these different areas um, to kind of come in and contribute and help um, figure out how to address these problems. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll get a flavor of, you know, what are the challenges we're seeing? Where are there opportunities for people to kind of jump into? And you know, You'll get a feeling for the idea that um, you know the things I'm very excited about are how do we use the biggest supercomputers in the world and answer questions we couldn't otherwise answer. But we're also starting to look into questions like you know how do we utilize new resources like cloud computing and make this more accessible on you know something that every hospital could use without having to own a supercomputer. And what are the kinds of questions we can get into on that that on that front? So just a little bit of background of, you know, what do I actually mean when I'm saying personalized flow simulations? So this is on a generic workflow of what we might look at. And it, it kind of gives you an idea of 
what, what we're trying to talk about allows you to start visualizing what I'm, what I'm, what I'm referencing here. So on the top left, what we're, what we're getting at is taking data from medical imaging. So typically this would be CT scans, MRI scans. We have some work with like biplane angiography, but allowing us to get patient specific medical imaging data and extract from that the patient's um, vascular geometry. So in our work, we use um, off the shelf commercial products for data segmentation. Uh, we, we personally use uh, mimics from Materialize, but um, there are many tools you could do to use to try to extract. So you're going through, you know, going through your Z-Stack, getting out, you know, at each level, what is the geometry of that patient's lumen, building that back together and getting a triangulated mesh file that's representing the 3D geometry of that specific patient. We're then um, applying, in our case, a regular Cartesian grid. We apply it over that rectangular mesh. We identify what's an inlet node, what's an outlet node, what's a fluid node. And then we solve equations of fluid dynamics at every single grid point within that mesh. This is incredibly computationally intense. So um, in our case, we use some of the world's biggest supercomputers to try to solve this. Um, I won't get into it here, but it, it's worth mentioning, you know, as you're thinking of these models, one of the biggest questions you, you should always bring to the table is why should you actually believe us? Why is this, why is this valid? And we've done a lot of work with, um, while, while our lab is in, in, you know, completely dry and completely computational, we collaborate with a lot of labs to ensure that we're validating the model. Um, in one case, we worked with David Frakes' lab out at Arizona State, where they would 3D print that same mesh that you're getting in the top right corner uh, that we get out of the, the medical imaging data and we put into our fluid simulation. We take that exact same mesh, we 3D print the mesh, and we run controlled fluid experiments through that geometry and compare, you know, using particle image velocimetry, the velocity profiles that you're getting out of that 3D printout with what we're getting on the simulation side to ensure that we're getting the correct flow profiles. We started with the aorta because it's more turbulent, there's the higher, um, higher, higher velocities, more chaotic flow, and we figured, you know, if that's, if we can get that correct, we'll, we'll be okay in other spaces. We've done similar experiments for the femoral geometry, the microvasculature, and different length scales. It's also important to um, validate with in vivo studies. So we've also, you know, looked at pressure gradients that you can measure with an invasive guide wire. Um, and using that guide wire, we then, you know, we've built a 200 patient database and we've compared what we get out of our simulations with what we're getting out of these in vivo measurements. So it's kind of just important to think about, you know, how are these models being validated as we kind of go along. Another piece we think about is like, how do the doctors actually interact with this data? Um, what's the best way to show them the data? How do you, you know, how do they, um, how are they going to extract the information that they need? And how do we actually want them to like actually interact with the data? So we have, you know, an entire like, line of research looking at the use of virtual reality and augmented reality in the space of what is the best way to change the geometry to potentially um, modify it to represent different treatment options before you ever go to the operating room. Or on the other hand, when you're looking at the output of the simulation, what is the best way to give it back to the doctor so they can quickly and accurately analyze the results? So what you're seeing on the bottom here is a picture of wall shear stress, which is a quantity that's known to be associated with the development of atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease. In one of the studies that was um, completed back when I was in graduate school by a visualization expert in the field was, you know, what is the best color map to give it back to the, to the physicians? What is the best representation so that they can identify those regions in a fast and accurate manner? And while the doctors, you know, that they're, they're they're used to seeing, you know, the rainbow color scheme. They're used to seeing, you know, a 3D model rotated in the exact uh, exact angle that they see in the medical textbooks. And that's what they really, you know, want to see. Um, they were actually able to show that it's much more effective to use, you know, the color map that you're you're seeing here and the 2D representation. So it's very important to kind of engage with the clinicians and engage with the users and understand the best way of getting that data back to them. So as I mentioned, you know, the exciting part of these types of models is that you, they, they can offer um, insight into many different areas of understanding um, vascular disease or other human diseases. So we're starting to see acceptance in the clinic uh, all over the world where, you know, in the US, we have several computational fluid dynamics models that have already achieved FDA clearance and are actually being used in the clinic today where, you know, they're taking data from a CT scan and they're um, measuring the fractional flow reserve 
which is a quantity that allows the physician to identify, should I or should I not stent the patient? So we're already seeing this in diagnostics and we're kind of seeing that expanding and expanding um, as, as we go. That's focused more on the coronary arteries. Um, you can see in the middle, we're starting to show that you can actually push this and run flow simulations on the scale of the full body. So we'll touch on this a bit in the talk, but kind of thinking of like, where does that go and how do we use that uh, to further this field of the di uh, non-invasive diagnostics? I've mentioned already the idea of treatment planning, but um, in here, you're taking that 3D mesh and you can change that mesh to represent, you know, if you were to place a stent, if you place a, st a shunt, if you do a bypass graft, how does that change the underlying anatomy for that specific patient? And we can allow the doctor to try, you know, 15 different options of that treatment, virtually see what the results would be, run those flow simulations before they ever go to the operating room and tune uh, their selection for that intervention and make it optimal for that patient. In our lab, we're also, you know, aside from the translational side, we're trying to use these large scale models to really get a better understanding of the underlying mechanisms that are driving disease progression, um, disease localization. So we're looking at questions like, you know, cancer, like why, you know, what is it about the specific cancer cells or circulating tumor cells that are causing them to metastasize to different locations? What is driving, you know, the locations that they're going to? What is driving their interactions with the endothelium? Why do we see this? Uh, why do we see certain metastatic sites over others? And then, you know, from the computing end, we're, we're really excited about how do we use the biggest supercomputers and there's a whole a whole side of just you know what are the ways of efficiently and robustly using the biggest supercomputers in the world what is the role that cloud computing can play and how do we kind of balance that uh, as we go forward so in the rest of the talk i'll try to touch on a few of these we'll, we'll kind of go over the impact that high performance computing has had um, in this field just kind of in relation to what i what i've been doing what i've seen We'll touch a little bit on the methods that we're using just to give you enough background to really understand um, what, what I'm talking about. And then I'll go through just a, a few different application vignettes and kind of end with a very different model um, of talking about this ventilator splitting work, just to kind of give a better idea of you know, places that models like this can have an impact uh, in, a very quick, uh, in a very quick way. So I think every everyone working with um, large scale supercomputers has to have their one picture with the big supercomputer. And sadly, I've been doing this for longer than we want to think about, but um, we, and these are the only two pictures of me with a supercomputer. But um, I've kind of wanted to give a, a, an overview of, you know, how computing scape has, has changed and how my experience with high performance computing has changed over the last um, you know, decade and a half. So kind of just the perspective here, you know, when I was in, in undergrad in 2005, um, I was getting a computer science degree, I had worked with one processor. And as when I left um, undergrad, I, had, I, mean, I, don't, I was very lucky to get a job at, Blue, at IBM as a software engineer working on their BlueJean supercomputer. I don't think at the time I fully understood what a supercomputer was or what BlueJean was. And um, I was incredibly lucky to join in 2005 because if you're familiar at all with the high performance computing space, BlueJean completely changed the field. And it, you know, it, 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 you know, it, it allowed us to have you know, we had these low process, like, you know, these, these um, low gigahertz processors where we could pack them all in and have an insanely high core count and start achieving things like multiple teraflops, 100 teraflop systems, getting on the path towards petascale, you know, it really set the stage for allowing us to um, build these large scale systems. And I was able to join you know, right after they, you know, the, the Blue Gene Ella system had come over, come up and you know taken over the number one spot on the, five, the top 500 list. I joined the development team in Rochester, Minnesota, where they were actually building these systems, and it was an amazing experience to see. You know, every, every day when you go into work and you try to get these applications to run on um, to run on the system, they were you know they'd be changing the compiler or changing the underlying operating system, and you never really knew if it was you know your code that didn't work or the new implementation of the MPI, and it was really know, a great experience to be a part of, you know, the cutting edge work as they're developing these systems and trying to figure out how we push every ounce of, you know, every single flop we could possibly get out of these systems. And um, you, may, you may hear a cat in the background. Um, but as we, um, as, as we worked there, we, we were able to, you know, I was working on the system when they pushed the Blue Gene L system up to about 65,000 processors. And while I was there, I remember like one of my, one of my colleagues had, you know, pointed out that this, you know, was such a phenomenal 
you know, when else are you going to have the opportunity to run on 65,000 processors? So at, you know, 21 years old, this seemed really exciting. We would come into work at like five in the morning because we would get access to the system um, at Lawrence Livermore in California before they would get up with the time change and be able to do some checks and get things going. So I'm really going into the office at 5 a.m. just to like for the opportunity to just boot 65,000 processors because that was just so you know, unique and exciting. Um, and then in 2009 and 2010, were my first real experiences with huge systems. So I was really lucky, and that's where these two pictures are from, to be involved with the Eulish Extreme Scaling Workshop. And that's where I really wanted to kind of lay the groundwork of the personalized blood flow side. Um, we were involved, um, my team from graduate school was involved in 2009 and 2010. And at that stage, you were given the opportunity to run on the entire Eulish system that at that stage was about 300,000 processors. Um, point out that if, you know, if the, the picture at the top is from 2009, and I think, it's a very small group of people at the workshop, but I think at least half of the people in that picture are now Gordon Bell finalists or Gordon Bell winners, partially from the work um, at this extreme scaling workshop that, that Bern Moore had been leading. But it's, um, it was a phenomenal opportunity and kind of exciting to see all of the you know, different fields and different areas coming in and trying to figure out how do we actually scale to these big systems. Um, I'll show some images in a few minutes that show what we were able to achieve on 300,000 processors and what it meant when we switched to something like Sequoia, um, the Blue Gene, Blue Gene Q at Lawrence Livermore Lab with about 1.6 million processors. And it had a really substantial impact on the amount of, you know, the amount of um, the body we were able to simulate and the type of questions we're able to ask. Today, we're part of the Aurora Early Science Program, and we're really trying to look forward to see, you know, okay, what does it mean when we actually get to Exascale? And I think that's the exciting point of how does that change the questions we can actually ask and what does that mean for this type of science? So what you'll see in this video, this is representing the work that um, was actually Gordon Bell finalist back in 2010. And this is the scale of what we were able to simulate at that stage. And this is running on the Eulish system, or um, the, this is a, a comparable to what we're doing on the Eulish system. I think this, this simulation actually ran on the Argon system on 140,000 processors, but it was that scale of a few hundred thousand processors. And we're looking at flow in the coronary arteries. And these models, you have about 200, 300 million, um, 200 to 300 million individual red blood cells. And the goal of this video is really to get across just why this is so computationally intense, what the challenges are that we're running into. And in this case, you're trying to model the individual red blood cells. In many cases, you know, what we're working on now, we're trying to understand the deformation. And it's not just a rigid particle, but that you know, individual red, part, red blood cells interacting with each other, interacting with the fluid, with the walls. Um, in our current work, we're trying to drop in cancer cells and see how all of those interactions, um, how they drive where that cancer cell is moving through the body. So you can kind of imagine why this starts to be so computationally intense and why we need these massively, these massively parallel supercomputers when we're trying to simulate these fluid structure interaction models on this scale. When we moved to 2015, our next Gordon Bell finalist work was um, pushing it from just looking at the coronary arteries to trying to take on, you know, the first models of the entire 3D, uh, the entire uh, 3D model of the entire arterial network. So on the scale of the human body, how do we actually run um, run simulations on this order? All of that for the full 3D sort system is still using bulk fluid, and it kind of shows at the end of this video what we're trying to do is couple that in with we still care about you know, fluid structure interaction, we care about the location of the red blood cells. So we can turn, you know, in, in high resolution regions of interest, we'll look at something like the fluid structure interaction and what's happening on that level. And then how do we do the multi-scale multi-physics modeling to capture both that bulk fluid um, on the order of the system. And then when do we need to identify the fluid structure interaction in the cellular scale? So trying to understand those couplings um, is a huge area of research in my lab and without that. Um, and outside of that. So kind of putting in perspective, you know, as we jumped from, you know, on the order of 100,000 to 300,000 processors, we're really able to push it and get, you know, all of the red blood cells in the coronary arteries. And now, you know, as we start to the like 1.6 million processors, processors, we could get to a nine micron resolution run of the full body. And then the next steps, we're trying to, you know, see how far can we push that and where can we get this cellular order resolution with the individual cells in different regions. So I put this up just as a, um, I know the audience today is, is very broad and coming from, you know, a wide area of different, um, different, different parts of computer science. And just the personalized blood flow models, 
presents so many challenges and it's such it's such an exciting topic for people all over the you know all over the map in computer science so we have problems that we're now running into with you know dealing with the images and you know how do you how do you automate an image segmentation how do we handle you know the next step is running these simulations on not just one patient but we want the ability to run it for every patient that comes in or thousands of patients and you know scaling up in that sense and in that way you need to have high resolution massively parallel you know high throughput imaging um, imaging analysis algorithms when we're dealing with these large supercomputers we have you know we're, we're pushing the bounds of how much data we have io is a huge issue how do we checkpoint how do we initialize how do we break up these problems on these new heterogeneous supercomputers now that we're generating so much data that's starting to you know overlap with the whole field of machine learning of how do we make use of the amount of data that we're generating and how do we really you know learn from these models in the best way when we're running these simulations we are using you know, the entire like the full memory of the biggest supercomputer so you know today that's maybe 5 10 petabytes in the future that can be on the order of you know 100 petabytes we are actually running simulations where you're using that entire space for every single time step so if we're running a simulation for a million time steps, you can kind of imagine just how much data we are generating and what that means. And that brings in so many questions of, you know, how do you actually analyze that data? We're doing a lot of work, which I'll touch on briefly, of you know, looking at in situ analysis. Um, it really emphasizes the need for in situ visualization, in situ analysis, in situ machine learning training. How do we really, you know, make use of this, this large scale data that we're, we're really generating? And then you know we're looking at questions like you know how do we use these new accelerators what do we do with the the you know the gpus and that those type of systems that are coming up how do we effectively use cloud computing where is that breakdown of when you should be using an on-prem supercomputer versus the cloud um, there are just there are so many different questions and um, areas for people to get involved with that we need you know we need to push the forefront in all of these spaces to really make this it's tractable so I'll kind of pause and just do a 30 second deep dive into just giving you an idea of the kinds of models we're using just to give you some background. Um, if you're familiar with fluid dynamics, you've probably taken, if you've taken any classes in fluid dynamics, you've heard of the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, we use an alternative approach. It's called the lattice Boltzmann method. I think the key pieces from a computer science end that you want to think about is it's really a stencil braced algorithm. So we are using a regular Cartesian grid and all of we're kind of viewing the fluid as if it's a bunch of particles. So kind of taking um, taking this discretized view, what we care about is the distribution of particles at each grid point, and they can move in a set of different directions. So you can kind of see on the top right, there is a set lattice that we're putting up, and we use a D through Q19. What that means is in each time step, these particles can move one grid point away. So they can move to one of these 18 neighbors or they can stay where they are. And we care about this overall distribution function of how many particles are at each grid point that can go in each of these different velocity directions. From the computer science end, the takeaway with that is that we don't have any global communication. Um, it's all nearest neighbor. So it's, you know, this is, this is where it lends itself incredibly well to large scale parallelization. It lends itself as we're using these large, um, these discretized grids and filling it into the, the STL, like the triangulated mesh files I was mentioning, we can handle complex geometries very well. Um, and we can get all of the information you may need locally. So you can get, you know, velocity, pressure, wall shear stress calculated without a global Poisson solver on your local node, um, using only near, nearest neighbor communication. So it, it lends itself extremely well to these kind of large scale models. And then I'll, I'll touch a little bit, just kind of building up of like, how do we actually think about, you know, how do we actually start making this tractable before I can jump into some of these applications? I'm gonna skip through some of this. From the very basic level, which most of you probably um, don't, don't need it to this level, but we're breaking it up um, spatially. So we have, you know, Every, every region of the coronary arteries or every region of the vasculature is being split up to different processors. That's basically you know, how, how we're breaking this down. There will be communication as flow moves from this part of the artery up to the next portion of the artery. It's not really as simple as just doing it along like the Z axis, which would be um, 
you know, very straightforward to code and much easier um, because you can imagine it's much better. Like you need to have an irregular domain decomposition. You're never going to have blood flow jumping from, you know, the artery in the far left to the artery in the far right. So, you know, it's better to have as much of one artery on one processor as possible to minimize that communication and kind of optimize how you're, how you're using your memory, your memory. So we do have this kind of inherent irregular domain decomposition is kind of one of the first steps of how we're splitting this up on the system. If you think about that, then like we have the, the model on the far right, there are basic things to really, you know, how do we actually you know, get this on the system? And the first step is we really need to minimize that memory footprint. So we, you know, we have this regular Cartesian grid, but then we have to do something like indirect addressing or semi-direct addressing, where we're only keeping in memory what is considered a fluid node, in node, wall node. Um, so what's on in or on the geometry itself. So if you imagine putting a bounding box around that body on the far right and filling that at the grid resolution that we're working with, um, at a nine micron resolution, which is what we did in our 2015 Gordon Bell paper, that would have required 90 petabytes just to fill that grid. Um, the system we were using at the time was, you know, only had one petabyte of memory. So that, that's obviously not possible. So a necessary first step is moving to something like an indirect addressing where you're only keeping in memory that fluid fraction. Um, I'll kind of go over this somewhat quickly, but you, know, you can kind of appreciate that one of the questions then is we had, you know, 1.6 million processors. So how do you actually initialize, you know, initialize the, the simulation domain across 1.6 million processors and actually split that up um, in an effective way. So we take that regular tri triangulated gr grid, um, we split it up across the, the, the tasks. Each task is going to compute all of the Y and in this case the Z points that intersect that triangle. So we identify what we call flip points. So anytime you're having a point that's you know, between where you would be crossing from inside the mesh to outside the mesh, we identify these flip points. We split those up across the different processors. Each task computes the local insidedness. So it's going across and it's almost like a ray tracing algorithm. So it's going across the domain that's on that task and essentially like shooting a ray across. And every time you hit a flip point, it's gonna just flip a bit from zero to one. So now we have this local, completely distributed memory light way of identifying, you know, am I inside or outside the mesh? But obviously we don't have a global view yet. So it's just you know, a first step. Then we execute a global XOR. So we move from zero, um, we move across, we complete an XOR operation between them and you're able to get from very local uh, local standpoint, again, in a very memory light way with, way with just the, um, the bit flipping, that, that, vision, that, that idea of, you know, am I inside or outside the mesh? We have that um, fully distributed initialization with a very minimal amount of, uh, amount of data. We then have to you know, figure out the, the load balance and um, handling that based on a cost function. So we have the amount of work for inlet, outlet, wall nodes. Um, and this is just an animation uh, from Liam Krauss at Livermore, and it's showing kind of how we split this up. So you'll see in the background the histogram of that cost function. And we go through and have a recursive bisection load balancer where we just continuously split up the work between the processors until it's evenly, um, evenly, evenly split. So you'll see as this kind of continues, um, it'll be colored by the amount of work and that value of that cost function and how we kind of split up the domain across each of these processors. We also have to think about questions like, you know, what is the memory layout? And, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have come into, you know, looking at, do we do, do we handle an array of structures, structure of array, a collection of these structures of array, like different ways of kind of splitting this up. This image helps you kind of visualize it just if you think about um, a two-dimensional lattice. So here we have uh, a set of the 2D lattice points and it shows you how you kind of split that up differently. So if you have an array of structures, you may iterate around that lattice point and store all of the velocity directions for that lattice point in a row and then move to the next lattice point. If you have a structure of array, we may do that where you store like, you know, every velocity angle that's going, you know, particles moving down to the left, down to the left, down to the left and iterate through all of the different velocity directions and put those next to each other in memory. And basically the point here is just, it, it ends up being very important to think about, you know, how are you storing your data and this, this changes based on what system you're working on. So it's, 
you know, when we completely optimized everything for the blue gene system and as a CPU homogenous architecture, we used one, uh, one, one memory layout. When we were moving over to the GPU, it's actually better to use a different layout. So it's, you know, trying to think of as you're trying to, to write your code, what's an agile way of doing that? How do we identify, you know, do you want to make the choice of just, you know, I'm going to optimize completely for the GPUs and that's what I'm doing? Or do you want to have the option of, you know, changing something as fundamental as your memory layout for your data structures? And kind of going all the way from our algorithms to something as um, as important as like the specific memory layout, the specific data layout, really does have a huge impact on the kind of performance you can get out of these systems. By taking this into account, we have been able to scale um, Harvey, which is our um, large scale code, on most of the major US supercomputers at this stage. So, you know, we're running on all of Summit, we've run on all of Sequoia, we've done a lot of work with both the Blue Gene system and the new GPU based architectures. What I'm showing here is just our scaling graph on all of, um, all of Sequoia, which was, you know, obviously just a, a few years ago, um, but it shows different representations of um, different arterial systems. We're looking at real geometries of the aorta femoral geometry, the aorta, the cerebral, and what you're seeing here is our strong scaling graph. So the one that's kind of interesting is, you know, looking at the aortal femoral, so the, the largest, most uh, like the largest geometry we're looking at here, at a 10 micron resolution, so that is the size of a red blood cell. So you're getting to the point where you could start to kind of resolve, you know, as a point particle, you can resolve uh, resolve cells. All of that at a 10 micron resolution. That dashed line is showing you that ideal, you know, that ideal scaling of, you know, you run on two processors, it goes twice, it runs twice as fast. You run in 1.6 million processors, it runs 1.6 million times faster. And we we're actually able to achieve, I think it was about like 98% scaling efficiency on the entire blue gene system. We're seeing very similar behavior when we're scaling on systems like Summit. Um, and we, we work very closely with Titan initially as well. So we're seeing similar behavior and working on, you know, how do we scale on the big, big GPU systems as well. And then um, it does get a little more interesting when you're looking at questions like the blue here showing the cerebral, that, that comes down to this load balancing question. This comes down to the surface area to volume ratio of, um, of the split of that geometry. So the more complex the geometry gets, the harder these, um, the, this, this becomes. And you start to see that little bit of deviation at you know close to the one million processors of um, from that linear scaling. So now I'll spend the rest of the talk just diving into a few of the applications, kind of giving you a flavor of how are we using these parallel models and what what do we see as the opportunities going forward. So as, as I'm sure many of you are aware, at least um, you know cardiovascular disease is one of the um, number, like, it's one of the highest burdens of heart diseases in the U.S., but also the world. Um, in the U.S. alone, there are over 370,000 deaths per year. Uh, what's really concerning to me was that, you know, 50% of men, 64% of women who die of cardiovascular disease may not have previously, you know, they may not have any previously detected symptoms. So what we were trying to do is to work with physicians to find ways of diagnosing this and identifying it earlier and see, are there ways that we can non-invasively identify, um, help, help physicians identify these patients at, at an earlier stage? Or you know, how, do we help, help patient, how do we help physicians identify in a non-invasive way? You know, should they place a stent or should they not? Or you know, how do we treat these patients? So what you're seeing in this animation here is the growing of you know, having um, a stenosis or a narrowed region in that blood vessel kind of building up along that blood vessel. And it's when that happens that you need to do something like an angioplasty or go in and place a stent. And we often see these regions, um, these regions of the of buildup start to occur tied in with these hemodynamic forces. So things like um, oscillating or low wall shear stress can be indicative of where you're likely going to see this happen. One of the questions we had, you know, you'll see a lot of simulations and depending on the question, you know, is it okay to simulate just one artery? Can we just, you know, it, it, you, you might not need a whole supercomputer to run one artery. Maybe that's something we could do on um, just a laptop. So trying to understand, do we need to have, you know, all of the arterial, like the full arterial network, what is that, what is that impact? And what we found was that it's very interesting, depending on the question that you're trying to ask, if you're looking at something like pressure, um, it may be okay to work with just one or a few of the vessels, but as you start to look at these more complex hemodynamic variables like wall shear stress, you really need to include all the side branches in your simulations, which does make it more computationally complex. It does make it you know, more challenging, 
but it's very necessary to have that full view um, as we move forward, which also ties back into the, the role of high resolution medical imaging. We need capability to, to actually resolve these individual uh, side branches. We need the collaterals. We need all of those vessels kind of included in these models. And what you're seeing here are just, this is looking at time average while shear stress. Um, and it's showing the difference of like how that would change. And this is looking uh, at one vessel as we're moving along the length of the vessel, looking at the average wall shear stress at each slice as we would move through that vessel. So it's, you know, looking at this vessel here and the change that you see when you include all of the other side branches. And you, you can just see visually like how, how different the time average wall shear stress is when we include all of those all of the side branches versus when we just model that single that single vessel so we've we've shown that it's it's very important to have you know high resolution imaging high resolution um, representation of the geometry of these um, of the patient specific vessels to accurately capture these complex quantities like wall shear stress the next step was trying you know we've we showed that it was possible to run um, a full 3D simulation on the order of the body, but why do you actually care? What, what, what's a doctor going to do with that? And one of the questions they were interested in is this, this quantity called ankle brachial index. And it's a metric that is used, um, it's used as diagnostic for every smoker over 50, every diabetic over 50, all patients over 70, they use this metric. It is a view of your systolic pressure um, at the ankle uh, for some reason, angle the over like at the ankle versus the arm, and it can be used to predict mortality, adverse cardiovascular events, and is commonly relied on to identify um, issues with the peripheral vasculature. And it's an important metric that physicians are really interested in. So, you know, in an initial study, what we tried to tried to look at was just, you know, can we identify the impact that small changes. Uh, or that local changes to your vasculature may have on global metrics like the ankle brachial index. So in this case, uh, one of the postdocs did a study where they you know, put in different degrees of coarctation in the aorta. Um, in one case, they put multiple, uh, multiple, multiple stenoses in the aorta and had a serial lesion um, and tried to see like, can we actually I, you know, accurately capture the effect that these local changes have on that global scale? And that's what you're seeing in these different color bars is just um, measuring the left, you know, the, the ankle brachial index, if you're looking at the left versus the right. And then when, you know, can we see the differences that occur in this global quantity with these different changes? And each of those color bars are showing a different change and a different representation of um, a stenosis in the aorta. We've also looked at, you know, everyone's try, trying, to, trying to see, you know, how do, we, how do we best use machine learning? And one of the studies that, that we used was a really kind of a, a different different use, I feel like, of um, machine learning. We were coupling it with design of experiments. And the idea here is, you know, when you have a patient's vasculature and you're trying to, to simulate and understand, you know, what's going to happen to them, there are many more instances, like there are so many different physiological conditions than what they can what than what can be measured in the doctor's office. So, you know, what happens if that patient gets pregnant? What if they're running? What if they're in Denver at high altitude? What if they're, you know, in Denver running at like at high altitude and pregnant? Like how do how do we how do we account for all the changes that could happen to a patient and kind of risk stratify, you know, when are they going to run into problems? What are the issues they could run into and give a better view of that patient? holistically in a wide array of, you know, when it's cold and you're shoveling snow outside, what is that doing to your heart? And can we predict that and not just look at the exercise condition or what you would normally look at in the doctor's office? But at the same time, these, these simulations are so computationally intense, it's not really tractable to run all of those different permutations for every single patient that comes in. So what Brad was asking is, you know, how do we actually identify, is there a minimal number of simulations and minimal number of pairings and physiological states that he could simulate and then use machine learning to predict the, re the, rest, of, uh, the rest of the results and predict the entire state space. So he used a ridiculous amount of compute hours and he used about like 70 million compute hours to actually validate this. And he ran all of the simulations for one patient for all of these different uh, physiological conditions. And then was able to identify that there was a minimal number of about nine different viscosity velocity pairings that allowed him to predict the entire parameter space. So that in the future, you could have this coupled mechanism of like, yes, we still need to run large scale fluid simulations. We can run a minimal number of large scale simulations and then use machine learning to predict the results for the rest.
Um, I mentioned this in the beginning, but I just wanted to, to really comment on this as well. Of, you know, we are trying to prepare for exascale and this is where, you know, other researchers can really jump in and help of, you know, we are, we're, we're generating petabytes and petabytes of memory per time step. And this, the, the gap between IO and computing needs is just increasing significantly. So a lot of, you know, a lot of the questions we're starting to ask and we're working closely with researchers at Argonne National Lab and Livermore National Lab to understand, you know, how do we actually access the data while it's still in memory during the simulation and use that to visualize it, to analyze it? You know, how do we actually, you know, it's, it's not tractable to just, you know, output all of this data and do any post hoc analysis on, you know, hundreds of petabytes of data. Um, so how do we actually get something useful out of the simulation and what are the ways we can kind of couple in? And we're, we're starting to look at a lot, you know, a lot of in situ studies, um, but kind of understanding both you know, how do you optimize your IO handling and how do you minimize the data you're trying to write out, but then how do you, how do you, how do, you do something meaningful with this amount of data? Um, I also kind of touched a little bit on um, some of the work we've done looking at the interaction with these models. So it's, it's great that we're building these large scale simulations, but we want them to be usable. We want them to go into the clinic. We want the doctors to be able to interact with the, you know, with the input and the output. So you know, we've created this tool called Harviz that allows doctors to work in virtual reality or augmented reality. So what you see in the middle is um, the Z space where you can wear the 3D glasses and kind of interact in the air. Um, we've, we've written this in Unity so it can run on Z, like Z space, HTC Vive, Oculus Rift, Oculus Quest, all of those. Um, so you can work with a head mounted display or you know, the same tool can work on your desktop and trying to understand like when do we need different levels of immersion and how does that influence the results? Um, so we've conducted a series of user studies trying to trying to question, you know, what level of immersion is is, is optimal for different behavior. Um, so if the physician is trying to determine where should I place a stent, do they need to see the fluid simulation results? Does it change where they place the stent when they see the results of wall shear stress? Is that important to give give to them? Like what quantities do we want them to see? And then what level of immersion is optimal? Because you know. We're used to seeing 2D desktops. When do we want, like, when is it useful to have a more intuitive interaction like immersion? Uh, we have shown that different levels of immersion and showing the, the results can improve your accuracy during treatment planning. And we're really trying to explore that relationship. And then I'll touch on a little, um, I know I'm, I'm running up on time, but I wanted to touch a little bit on the, the, the use of um, the, the flow model. So everything I've talked about at this stage has really gone back to that bulk fluid. We, we really care about how you model individual red blood cells and getting that cellular resolution on the scale of the full body. This is obviously a multi-scale problem. It requires multi-physics modeling. Um, we're using you know, our lattice Boltzmann method. We're coupling it with a finite element model of the cell using a MERS boundary. And we've started looking at this in a variety of areas. So I've mentioned a few times that we're really excited about using these models to understand cancer metastasis. And one example here, uh, we've worked with a team at Lawrence Livermore National Lab where they're able to 3D bioprint an endothelialized channel, run these fluid experiments, put cancer cells in that endothelialized channel, and we can try to understand what we're seeing in those, um, in those experiments using our fluid simulations. So on the bottom, you're looking at a basic, you know, can we look at what is the wall shear stress at regions where we're seeing a lot of adhesion? So we're trying to identify, you know, are there hemodynamic biomarkers that are guiding that adhesion, that adhesive level, and then using the fluid structure interaction models, you know, what is it about the cell? What are the mechanical properties about the cell that are really leading toward um, the behavior that we're seeing in these complex geometries? Uh, from a computer science standpoint, this made it more interesting. You know, not, we've now scaled our fluid model. Now we actually need to fluid, scale the fluid structure interaction model as well. Um, here's just an initial initial studies we had scaling to about um, uh, 192 GPUs and 1,000 CPU cores, and we're now running on like all of um, all of Summit at Oak Ridge National Lab. And this is where we start. You know, it starts to get even much more complex because the underlying fluid model needs to be run at a much higher resolution because you want to capture that deformation. Um, in each individual red blood cell. And if the red blood cell is about 10 microns across to actually capture the deformation, you can imagine the, the level of resolution we have to go to. Um, and that, that also leads to the idea of, you know, we're, we're looking at adaptive physics refinement. So different multi-physics models to have different scales at different, um, at different points in the geometry. Can we couple these large scale bulk fluid models to, 
you know, a high resolution window that is moving and tracking that cancer cell through the body. Inside the window, we have all of the explicit red blood cells outside the model. Um, it's just bulk fluid. And then, you know, how do you actually do this efficiently? Do we put, you know, the window on the GPUs or the window on the CPUs, or how do you split this up across a heterogeneous architecture efficiently? And these are the kinds of things we're trying to think about and move forward. So I wanted to make sure I had time to just touch on a very different model, um, but I think it's it's an interesting use case. It gives gives a feel for why are like you know how are these models important? How can they make an impact quickly? And um, a few interesting takeaways. So, as I'm sure all of you are very aware, you know about a year ago, one of the first problems that came up when when COVID nineteen was really you know. Um, really, we were really realizing how serious everything was. One of the first issues that came up was this question of, vent of ventilator shortage. Uh, in the US alone, it was predicted to be about 45,000 to 160,000 ventilators um, as a shortfall. And we really needed a way to push this ventilator capacity and increase that ventilator capacity around the world. And it was a phenomenal project where, you know, before we even got involved, there was a huge team from Duke that immediately jumped in and they created a brand new device led by Moat Bashawi, where they were able to split a ventilator and split a ventilator safely between patients that didn't have to be matched. So before, um, you know, you shouldn't split ventilators, but if you were going to split the ventilator, they would have to match the patient in terms of height, weight, um, you know, respiratory compliance. And it was very difficult in these settings to like, find you know, specific matched up patients where you'd be able to split the ventilators. And they created a brand new tool that could be 3D printed and tuned to specific patients and allow them uh, to be paired where they had disparate conditions, which was huge in that it would allow you to really like at least double the ventilator capacity, if not further. Um, I do want to say as a caveat, again, like we in no way would recommend ever splitting ventilators. It should only be used under dire circumstances, uh, which sadly that, you know, that that's where we've been for the last year. Um, but it is, it's, it's not something we, we would ever recommend doing. So Moath came to us and said, you know, we've created this tool. Um, we, we, what we really need is a way to get it in the hands of the doctors and help the doctor know how to tune the tool and how to use it for specific patients immediately. So you can kind of see what was needed here is, and this is the, um, uh, the, the interface that we ended up making, the doctor would be able to put on their mobile app, on their mobile phone, the weight of the patient, the compliance of the patient, um, information about the ventilator itself, and then get results on what like you see on the right of, you know, with different resistors, so different ways of tuning that, that product, um, what would be the delivered PIP and PEEP, like how the tidal volume, so what is the most optimal outcome for using these, um, each resistor for that set of patients, so it would tell the doctor which resistor they should actually use and how they should tune it for that patient. We wanted to have all of that data available so that the doctor wouldn't have to wait for the simulation result. And we also wanted all of the available data so that the FDA could actually review everything that we would be providing to the physicians. So that meant trying to calculate everything ahead of time. We built this reduce order model, which I won't go into given the time. Um, but, uh, you know, within, you know, I think that the interesting points here were, you know, Moath's team built this device within two to three weeks of the pandemic happening um, and really just did a phenomenal job pulling that together. My team was, was asked to come in probably it was like the first, it was the first week of lockdown um, here in the state. So it was early, early days in March, end of, or sorry, in April, end of March. Um, within a couple of days, they created a brand new model, which, you know, everything I've talked about here is blood flow modeling. Modeling airflow is actually slightly different. So they weren't able to use Harvey and they, they actually switched and created a brand new model, um, validated against benchtop experiments using mechanical lungs. And that's what you're seeing here. And then we needed to run all of the simulations. And there were over 200,000 different combinations when you were looking at all the different potential values you may see when you have different patients, different ventilators, and that resulted in a huge number of simulations that we had to run. So we turned to the COVID-19 HBC consortium, and this was a really interesting setup where all of these different companies had come together and donated time to allow uh, researchers to use these, these kinds of this scale of resources. And it was interesting where we, you wrote a proposal that was really science driven. So it was, you know, here's my problem. 
couple, you know, you, you weren't asking for specific hardware. It was like, give me whatever, whatever would help me solve this problem. So on a Monday, we wrote the application and kind of had the pie in the sky of like, it would be great if we could run all of these 200,000 simulations. Um, by Thursday, we had been paired with Microsoft. They gave us the compute time to actually run everything and not have to pare it down. Um, we had a call with them on Thursday and by Friday night, we were up and running. By Monday, we had completed 800,000 um, compute hours in the cloud. We were able to run all of the simulations and we were able to submit all of the information within you know, one week of um, actually submitting just the proposal. We were able to um, have all of the data for the FDA submission completed and ready there. Um, so it was, it was just a, it was, it was a phenomenal, um, just everyone coming together and making sure that this was able to happen. I don't think the students or you know the team from Microsoft or the Duke Office of Information Technology slept at all that weekend. Um, but it was it was amazing that of you know what is the power of what you can get get completed first when you're looking at something from a problem driven focus, bringing the right people into the room, bringing an interdisciplinary team into the room to make sure we could complete this, and using something like cloud computing where they were able to grow, you know, get the resources necessary and the time frame required. So I'll kind of wrap up there and um, open it up for questions. And th thank you again so much for, for inviting me to be here today. Thank you very much, Professor Amanda. It was uh, an interesting talk, switching from blood flow modeling to airflow modeling in the beginning of lockdown. That sounds non-trivial. Yes. There are a lot of questions. Let me read them out uh, in order. Uh, I'll start with the questions in the chat box, which were posted by people who are in, as panelists. First question is by Professor Jayant Haritsa. So he asked, could Amanda comment on the suitability of these fluid dynamics based computational models for quantum computing platforms? Um, yeah, I, I will say I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, but I'm, I'm very excited to see what we can do. I think some of these models, there has been some success um, I'm trying, it, it depends on your algorithm. There has been some success already of moving like stencil-based codes onto quantum systems. So I think there, there is a lot of potential for something like the lattice Boltzmann algorithm, coupling it with, with, um, with quantum computing. Specifically, I, I think the lattice Boltzmann itself would lend itself very well to quantum computing, and that's a really interesting direction. Um, I, I, I haven't tried it yet, but I do. I, do um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Thank you. The second question by Professor Jain is how do they model turbulent flows which could occur, for example, if a patient had a leaky valve in the heart? Right. Um, so but there are, um, can we figure out the, the right level of getting into it? Like for, for our end, um, with a lot of Spoltzman, you can modify it to add, like you can easily add in turbulent um, turbulent models and, and capture it with the lot of Spoltzman models. We do typically, everything we're using is a lot of Spoltzman. You can obviously capture turbulent flow on the Navier Stokes side, but um, in our end, um, you can add more complicated turbulent models. It's been interesting, but like the use cases we've looked at, we haven't, we haven't needed, um, we haven't needed those models yet. Um, but we haven't modeled, like we haven't modeled a, a leaky valve at this stage. Um, it is, we've, we've, you know, talked to labs and like talked to other research groups that are really developing, you know, how do you couple these turbulent models with lattice Boltzmann? What we, for the aorta, um, the aortic models we've looked at, and even with coarctations, you have a pretty, a pretty narrow, uh, narrow um, stenosis in, in the coart in, in the aorta, which leads to like almost turbulent flows, a very high Reynolds number, maybe up to you know, a few thousand, and we're seeing significantly high Reynolds numbers, even when we're comparing to like the particle image loss symmetry models, as, as mentioning, we do see like, you know, the backflow and like, in, like the more chaotic flow kind of occurring and we are able to replicate that, but we haven't crossed over into a turbulent regime. So there are ways to extend these models and it's, it's actually a fairly straightforward extension, um, but we haven't had to put that into our models yet. Yeah, thank you. This is a question by Utpal Bora. Does the parallel computation also exploit fine-grained share memory parallelism within a node? If so, which is the framework that is used? So we, we use OpenMP. Um, it's it's so the code. Our code is uh, we're using OpenMP uh, for the fine grain. We use MPI typically, and then we do for the GPU side. We specifically use Kuda. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's a combination of OpenMP, MPI, and, um, and CUDA for our code. 
Thank you. Uh, Rajiv Shuri has two questions. The first one is accuracy being a critical metric in blood flow modeling. What are the key factors affecting the accuracy of the results? Um, that's, that, that's, yeah, I feel like most of our studies, we actually end up running huge sensitivity studies trying to understand for each question what, what really matters. And a lot of it really does, um, you know, boundary conditions are obviously very important. Trying to make sure that you're accurately capturing boundary conditions can significantly influence like, the, the outflow conditions, making sure, you know, how you're representing flow splitting and boundary is a huge, huge issue. Um, so I said boundary conditions are important. And then obviously, like the geometry that we're getting and making sure that you know what you're actually inputting to the simulation itself is you know, changing you know, that high resolution, um, the segmentation, the reconstruction of your geometry, and making sure you know when we're looking at something at a coronary artery, the severity of that stenosis and making sure you have that you know the degree of stenosis correct is going to have a huge impact on some of the results that you're getting. Um, so it's that tie-in with the medical imaging and the resolution of the images that we're getting that can have a, have a, have a, a really big effect. Um, and it does it does matter, you know, what exactly you're asking if you're looking at something like wall sugar stress versus pressure, you know, that can change slightly of like what, what matters more, but it is really like it's coming from the geometry and your boundary conditions, I would say are a large part of it. And then obviously um, on a lot of Boltzmann and the, you know, the, the, the resolution that you're running at and like what grid spacing you need to get convergence and to run in a stable way and an accurate um, and accurately get the flow um, is also a key, key, key for me. Thank you. Second one is by Rajiv again. Please share your thoughts on the appropriate granularity in your simulations, cell level, tissue level, organ level, etc. Yeah, that um, I think it's a, a really good question. It, it really does change. Um, the granularity need changes based. I feel that yeah, it's it, it's it's not that satisfying. But it really does change based on what, what question you're trying to ask. Um, for most of the fluid models that I was showing, so when we're looking at something like coronary arteries, if you're trying to simulate and you know, uh, like what as I mentioned, like there's there's the FDA approved codes where they are looking at fractional flow reserve. So it's a pressure gradient across the stenosis. And they're trying to calculate, you know, is that fractional grade, is that fractional flow reserve um, above or below 0.8? And based on that, they'll decide should I or should I not place a stent in the patient. To accurately, to accurately model flow in those spaces, what we're looking at is a pressure gradient in coronary arteries. You don't need to explicitly resolve red blood cells. And you don't even um, in our models, we don't even need like, we have rigid walls uh, when we're looking at um, the coronary space. So you can actually make a lot of assumptions there where you're looking at you know, bulk fluid, rigid walls, and you can, get, you can still accurately get you know, fractional flow reserve in the coronary arteries. When we're trying to ask questions like cancer cell trajectory, when we're looking at the microvasculature, you obviously you need to have the cellular level, you need to have you know, the cells explicitly um, simulated to understand how, how are those red blood cells influencing where that cancer cell is moving, where it's you know, interacting on the endothelium, and you have to go to that cellular resolution. So it's, um, it's, it's really driven by you know, yeah, what, what question you're trying to ask and what you're trying to answer. And a lot of the cancer work we do explicitly have to model the cells. Um, for the larger vessels, um, often you can get away with just doing bulk fluid and that, that side of things. Yeah, we do have a few more questions. I hope it's all right. So the next question is by Manish Gupta, who is also in uh, the panel. So could your simulations in the context of cardiovascular diseases be used to recommend and evaluate lifestyle interventions to prevent adverse cardiac events? So I, I think, yeah, again, like, I think that's a great question. I really, I think that's the direction that we're going. Like, I think I think you could in the future. Um, and that's where this kind of feeds into being a huge computational challenge and where there's so much opportunity for people to kind of get into it now. Right now, the simulations that I was showing you, um, we typically run for one or two heartbeats. Like it, it takes, you know, a large amount of compute time to simulate just you know five or six heartbeats. Um, if we want to try to start incorporating lifestyle changes and see you know what happens if that patient were to exercise for half an hour versus twenty minutes versus you know like what are different options and things like that. Um, we need to be able to model at least you know, a few hours of, of, on the other day. And I think that's where the coupling in of a, you know, 
we've kind of focused on the grand challenge of how do we grow this spatially and look at much larger domains. The next grand challenge is going to be, you know, how do we extend the time point? How do we do this? You know, how do we extend temporally what we can actually simulate? And that's 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 the direction a lot of people are going, and it's a key that, that would be really important to be able to look at you know, questions like that. Um, and that's also a great place where you know we can start tying in with all of the researchers on the machine learning end, and how do we you know, how do we actually get to the point where we can understand longer temporal domains now that we can run these high resolution you know, large large field large spatial views. Um, but I think you could, you could it, it's definitely a great use case for these types of models, but a little bit more work needs to needs to go in to push these further. Uh, quick follow up. I mean, do you think uh, with machine learning you could accelerate things enough to be able to do this? I, I think there's potential. I think. I, I think. Um, yeah. I, I think there are. I think there. Are, we've we've been talking to a lot of a lot of other research groups about ways to uh, ways to predict longer time periods and how would we break it up. And I think. I, I think there is potential to do that. It, it um, kind of like what we were talking about with um, like with Brad's work with the design of experiments. I don't think, you know, it, it's going to be a pairing of, you know, let's do you know, a pairing of um, still running high resolution flow simulations, but we can, you know, pair specific flow runs um, with the machine learning to be able to predict longer time periods. And I, I think there is a lot of potential there, um, but it's, it's, it's it's an active area of research and it needs like that we need to have more people in that space but i, I think that's it's definitely worth looking at because i think there is there are concrete like concrete ways of doing it so by the way really enjoyed your talk and it was great to see references to blue gene i worked on blue gene l when i was at ibm watson so great oh, yeah i was thinking about it manish yeah thanks so the next question is by harsh so he's asking, can we find the highest probabilistic metastatic site in cancer patients with your current models? I'm trying to, I think I think we're almost like from from our I, that, that's the goal. Um, that's what we're trying to get to. Um, where we have not been able to run those studies yet, and I feel like where we are um, in the last. Even just the last year, um, we've we've done the low level studies of you know can we validate basic things of you know doing the red blood cell you know, like the optical tweezer and making sure that you're accurately getting you know, the properties of a, of a red blood cell on a single cell level and then trying to expand up to thousands and millions of cells. Um, we've recently completed a study with um, Scott Manalis's lab up at MIT where we were comparing specific cancer cells and ensuring that our models were actually like could be tuned to capture the mechanical properties of um, like a lung cancer cell versus you know other types of cells to make sure uh, we're accurately capturing the behavior of those specific cells. Um, so we've now you know we've really been focused in validating. So like both validating each component of the model and then scaling up the model. And I'd say it's really been only in the last few months that we're actually at that point where we, you know, we have that validated model for specific cancer cells. We can run large geometries with millions and millions of cells in them. And we can now start to do these tests to see, you know, for these different patients, are you actually getting, you know, if you take, you know, a primary tumor, you know, certain primary tumor location, run the models, are you getting, you know, high occupational, um, probability locations that match what we're seeing um, as the most likely secondary sites and can we start probing that and, and that's kind of like our that that's been the goal over the last five or six years of like can we build up to that stage and I'd say we're really we're just at that point where we can start running those simulations so I'm, I'm hopeful that that's you know, that's how we would start using these tools and you know we can then tune the cancer cell model to specific cancer cells tune it to different types of geometries and see you know, how do those cells move through the vasculature? We even have um, one student looking at the individual like ligand receptor pairings to simulate, you know, from the, we're going from the systemic side all the way down to, you know, individual ligand receptor pairings to look at cellular adhesion to try to see, you know, how does that play in um, and understand where uh, these cancer cells are actually adhering and why and how that influ is influenced by things like well shear stress and therefore like receptor expression. Um, but I guess the, the long, the, the short answer there is uh, we're, we're I'm hopeful that that's what we can do with these kinds of models, and that is the goal with these types of models. But that we are we are only just at that point now. Yeah, thank you. We have three more questions. I hope it's all right. Yeah. So the next question uh, uh, is by Utpal, 
can you put some light on challenges or open problems that you think are critical and compute that a computer science or compiler researcher can target? Um, yeah, I think there 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 are so many there are so many areas that we that you know we that we need help on. Um, so there are you know. I mean, there. Yeah, I don't even know where to start with that. There, there are so many questions of you know when we're trying to tune these models. You know, portability is always a huge issue, right? Where you know we have done you know what we were saying before, but we we've done so much work, especially like under the Gordon Bell context of like how do we really tune this system? How do we tune the code to run specifically on the BlueJean system or specifically on you know Summit? And I think that question of portability of trying to get to you know how do we get these system like how do we get these codes? You know, when I, when I mentioned initially that, you know, when you're running on the CPU versus the GPU array of structure versus structure of array, you know, just that fundamental setup, um, it's very important that we switch um, and have a different setup on, you know, on one piece of hardware than the other. And having automated ways, you know, that are kind of, you know, the people in my lab, some of them, you know, the biomedical engineers may never have taken these low level computer science classes. We don't want the applications level scientists to have to think about, do I need to switch from array of structure to structure of array? And how do I do this? And having all of that kind of happen behind the scenes happen automatically and you know, be able to you know, optimize memory usage, optimize memory, um, memory movement, and all, like all of those behind the scenes questions to make something more portable as we get these new systems. Um, all of that is incredibly important for us and will be really helpful. I think from a generic side, the um, just that, like I kind of mentioned in the beginning, the dealing with the I/O and the amount of data that we are um, that we're generating, there there are a lot of opportunities there. Like, how do we optimally? How, how do, what do we store? How do we store it? Um, a lot of the questions we're looking at now are, you know, if we run the full simulation, are the like on the big supercomputer? Are there ways to then, you know, store? checkpoints and store part of, like how do we you know efficiently store parts of that data so that we could you know regenerate a high resolution repli replicate of you know what required that entire supercomputer but maybe only get a high resolution region of like just one vessel and replay the simulation of what happened in just that vessel without having to run the entire simulation at the resolution that does require the whole supercomputer but how do we maintain that resolution but do it on a smaller system um, how do we, you know, set things up so like, it, yeah, when, when we think about things like machine learning, like how do we train on the big supercomputer so that we can like kind of couple the system of like what can we do later on a smaller supercomputer, a smaller cluster and kind of, you know, go in on that end. Um, but anything dealing with any of the IO optimization, any of the checkpointing, improved load balancing, like all, all of that, all of those are questions that we kind of run into and have, have a lot of difficulty. Um, I think it's, I think computer scientists, this is very natural for everybody, but it was just kind of an interesting, you know, when you're going from running on like two processors or four processors to trying to run on hundreds of thousands of processors, you can no longer have a global communication table because, you know, that may take up the entire memory of that small, you know, small memory per processor. Um, it's no longer like just initializing the simulations and figuring out ways of, you know, how to handle those communication tables, all of that ends up being more challenging than you think it's going to be. And there are opportunities for um, the computer scientists to kind of come in and help us out and, and contribute on that end. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next question is from Preeto Deep, uh, who says uh, he found your talk very engaging. Thanks you for that. And uh, so he says that, uh, does the simulation include lymphatic vessels? And if not, can it be extended to the lymphatic system as well? Yeah, so it does. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. The second question is probably partly answered in response to the earlier question. So the second question says, what are the technical bottlenecks that can limit the field applications in these simulations? Yeah, so I guess, I guess the comments on that, like, yeah, so, so the, yeah, it ties in of, um, we do not currently have anything, we are not, we have not looked at the lymphatics, uh, we've had conversations about how to do this, um, but we haven't done that yet. Um, there are a few groups that have kind of started looking at the lymphatics, like Lance Munn's group at Harvard, I, I think has gotten into that space a little bit. Um, but it, it's 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 mostly unexplored, um, but it's a great area that people should be looking at. And I, I think there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, from our end, you know, when you're when you're trying to look at like where can you apply these models, 
um, it's anywhere where we can, if, if we can have a 3D mesh and a 3D geometry, you know, we can take that and we can run the flow simulation as like from a broad, broad spectrum of um, as long as, yeah, uh, where it, it's tuned for fluid flow or for um, like the liquid side of things. Um, but it is, it, it can be used for anything where you, as long as you have the geometry, um, but the other pieces that kind of come in when you're trying to think of like what applications to extend this to, it matters, you know, Right now, we have one PhD student who is adding in, um, like his, his role has been getting, we have deformable cells, but we only had rigid walls for a very long time. So now we're having, you know, we're adding in the deformable walls, something like the lymphatic system, or even just looking at the venous side, you really want to have the capability to not just have deformable walls, but you may want to be able to have like a heterogeneity and mechanical properties of the wall and ensure that that's handled um, in an efficient and scalable way. So I think it's 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 things like that of when you're trying to think of what you know what applications can you apply this to, um, you know the compute power and the compute resources required kind of jumps exponentially when you need when you're looking at questions that require like the fluid structure interaction, whether that is um, you know the deformable walls or like the deformable cells, and then when you go down the cell path, do you need to capture you know do you need the adhesion? Do you need like the individual ligand re receptor pairings? Do you need to have a nucleus? Do you need to have you know a different viscosity of the fluid in the nucleus or out of the nucleus? And all of these are possible, but it does change you know the the size of the resources required to run these simulations. So it's um, kind of going from that pairing of you know we're always trying to ask. And we try to put as much into the model as possible to then figure out what we can then take out um, to do, to you know run the simulation accurately with a minimal um, the minimal simulation like capabilities because if you ever do want this to go into the clinic or be more usable and run like large parameter sweeps it can't be something that requires you know five months on the world's biggest supercomputer um, so it's it's kind of trying to get that balance of you know what do you need to have a high fidelity model and how do you validate the model but then how do you then back that back out and make it tractable to apply to these different areas and i think as you're trying to think of what other applications can you look at it we are really gated um i guess the last thing i say is that it's really gated by where can you get that triangulated mesh and where can you get realistic geometries um, so that's, you know, when you're, when you're, you know, we've been looking at a lot of projects to understand flow in the microvasculature and we've, we've done a lot of work with people who are bioprinting, but if you want to look at patient specific microvasculature that's going to require high resolution images um, that take that, 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 that have, you know, um, micro ST or like whatever you want to get, but like, how, like can have a high resolution image of the microvasculature. So it's, you know, if you're trying to think of moving it to the lymphatic space or other spaces, it's, you know, where can you get that data and can you get the geometries and the um, parameterization for the flow profiles in those spaces? Thank you. Sorry, we have two last questions. I do hope it's all right. <laughs> uh, so this question is from Harsh, who says, what about microflow models in places like alveoli in the lungs? So um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a great it's a great place for, for this, these kinds of models. We have um, we did do an initial study where we worked with Jordan Miller's lab at Rice, where he again we've done a lot of it's more with the bioprinting. Um, so trying to validate the use of these models for specifically modeling alveoli in, in the lungs. Um, in that case, you know we've looked at you know just several, like it's a very, very small um, simulation. What we've been working on with him is, you know, as he can build his capabilities up in the bioprinting space, you know, can we couple that with doing large scale models to kind of tune what you should be bioprinting in that area. But you could also imagine, you know, then applying that to understanding flow in a patient, you know, it, it, like in vivo um, on the lung side. And there, there's a lot of research in those spaces. And I think it's a great it's a great application of, of these models. Again, this is a space where we really need that validated deformable wall model um, in place to kind of scale up on that end. Um, but that is an area where we're, where we're starting to see a lot of flow models being used. Thank you. So we go on to the last question. As you're answering this, there's a small request on behalf of the organizing oh. committee. If you don't mind, they would like you to stop screen sharing because they would like you to take and keep your video on because they'd like to take a nice picture of your talk. So I do hope that's all right. So we're on to the last question. Given that these were multi-scale simulations, at what point did the scale change need multi-scale modeling? Any quick comments on how the model changes? And if any changes, how were they handled physics-wise and computation-wise? Yeah. Um... But that, that, there's a long answer for that. Uh, 
so for our our end, um, I'm trying to get the right like we've looked at a wide variety and a lot of it really does come down to, you know, how do you validate this and how do you, um, how do you build up the model so that each piece is validated? We have kind of a spectrum of options to look at different, different scales and different physics-based models. So we have one researcher um, in the lab who's developed a 1D to 3D coupling. So he's looking at how does um, like VA ECMO. So it's, um, but like he, he's, he's looking at, you know, artificial, uh, when art, artificial heart, um, when you're like pumping for the heart out of the body, how you can change flow rates and how that influences influences flow in the body. Um, but the point with that is like he's had to build, he's looking at flow, you know, on the order of the whole body. So he's coupled a one dimensional model of the body. And then he's trying to ask questions like what, you know, how do changes in your ECMO setup lead to neurological outcomes and like um, negative neurological outcomes. So he has three dimensional flow models of the brain and the cerebral vasculature coupled to the full body being represented in a 1D model where he doesn't necessarily need the 3D like high fidelity. So he has, you know, in that case, we have different scale, you know, we're looking at multi-scale models of coupling that 1D model to a 3D model. And we've had to do a lot of work of trying to validate. Um, in our case, we're kind of lucky where we can run a full 3D model of the entire body and see, you know, did he get the same flow simulation results in that cerebral vasculature if he were to run the full 3D model or if he had it coupled in with the 1D model on that end. So we've done a lot of work to try to validate that you are still, you know, if you do run the high resolution full blown simulation, do you end up getting the same, the same results as you kind of go down into a lower order model? Um, we also have looked at, you know, looking at Van Kessel models for boundary conditions, but then we have the like coupling of, you know, a fluid structure interaction code to just a bulk fluid mode code. So having, you know, different, like very different physics models of even just if you're thinking about it, like the bulk fluid model, the viscosity of the flow, the, the viscosity of the blood is coming from all of the hematocrit and all of the red blood cells being taken into account. So you, you're coupling that to a model that has individual red blood cells where the fluid is actually the plasma so that you know you're, you're coupling like just the fluids themselves being coupled have different viscosities and their instability mm -hmm. they're going to come up on that end um but anyway it comes from you know there's a lot of you know we, we have people with phds in mathematics working on that to make sure we have a stable coupling of multi-scale modeling like you have it's similar to an adaptive mesh refinement technique um, that we're more familiar with on the computer science side so how do we use these multi-grid approaches and do that from a stable standpoint numerically um, and then what are the right physics-based models so coupling in with immersed boundary the, um, the finite element models on the like on the cells with the fluid um, there are, yeah, there, are, there are a lot of places where this multi-scale modeling and multi-physics modeling really comes into play with the work that we're doing. You know, so like, you know, a lot of the approaches, you know, what we're, we're trying to do is really just couple that with, you know, you're doing both the verification and the validation of like, are we actually getting, you know, what we think we're getting in there? Are we getting, you know, a lot of numerical studies to test each component and the convergence and stability for each component and then building that up and identifying, like I mentioned with the, the fluid structure interaction, we, we've done a lot of work um, I think we spent like two years on just, you know, are we getting one red blood cell correct? And like comparing that to um, optical tweezers to um, different microfluidic experiments and like validating that against what we're seeing with the experiments and then scaling it up. Like now that we can do one cell, we simultaneously, simultaneously had other researchers, you know, doing the computer science side of how do we scale that up to a million cells. Um, so you have like the researchers really validating each individual component, making sure we trust each individual component and then how do we scale that up and bring it together. And then making sure at the end of that, that you're going back and checking, you know, continuing to validate against the large scale models, um, like once you've actually put it all in place. So um, I guess on the computer science side, a good way of, of commenting and wrapping up of like, you know, when we're looking at it in our case, um, there, the software engineering practices are incredibly important. Um, so it is, you know, we have everyone in the lab working in the same code. So it kind of comes into the, you know, version control is significant, continuous integration is important. Um, so I think the things that the computer scientists think about that maybe not, like isn't as common in something like biomedical engineering, um, it, it has been incredibly important to bring these core software engineering and computer science approaches to an application specific lab to really make this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for patiently answering all the questions. Uh, We're uh, extremely thankful for you to have, as Professor Jayant said, gotten up early in the morning, first thing to talk to all of us here. I found your talk very inspiring, as you said, from computer science to physics, to high performance computing, to downright software engineering, which we take for granted. 
best wishes to you. We do look forward to seeing you in India soon. Do come to Bangalore and to Chennai. Thank you very much. Thank you again for inviting me.